Hi guys, hope you are well. The Wi-Fi is out in my building, so I had to come across the street to one of these uh, like uh, temporary office, like WeWorks, the Regis, I guess it is. It's kind of like a, a, a WeWork thing. So that's why the, the lighting is kind of weird. <laughs> I just rented an office for the day. So uh, anyway, that's not what's important. The content is what's most important. And I'm doing some research for a video tomorrow, and I came across some really, really interesting stuff that I thought you guys would enjoy. Not It's not really breaking news or anything like that, but in a way it is, because most of us realize that we're in an economic crisis. Uh, I would say that it's a, a depression. Now, whether it's an inflationary depression or a deflationary depression, I guess that's up for debate. Right now, it's looking like it's going to be an inflationary depression, but it's just basically lower economic growth, like lower economic output. I would define that as the economic output by the private sector. I don't really count the, the government um, GDP because that's just distorting the economy. And if the government was 100% of GDP, I don't think anyone in their right mind would claim that that's a, a solid economy. It's not something we want to strive for. So I just look at the private sector output. And if you see the private sector output, economic output decreasing, you have high structural unemployment, then to me, that's that's a depression. Now, whether prices go up or down, I don't even think that's relevant. I just think it's all about the standard of living for the average Joe and Jane going down. And that's what we're facing right now. But we've experienced this situation many times in the past, many, many times. So I think what we have to do to figure out how we solve the problem, first and foremost, we have to pinpoint, okay, we've got a problem. Uh, what is the problem? Therefore, how do we fix it? And that's where it gets difficult. And that's why I think very few people have answers. But I think if we go back in history, the, we've got the answers. We just have to go far enough back and we just have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. So uh, I was listening to my, my great buddies, Emil Kalinowski and Jeff Snyder. We'll get to them in just a moment. And they shed some fantastic insight on quote unquote economic slowdowns or depressions that we've had in the past. Uh, the one that we focus on or they focus on that I've been focusing on is the panic of 1873. So we know that prices went down consistently throughout the 1800s. And uh, most of the time, those prices going down was a reflection of, of a positive economic growth because the we had a free economy for the most part uh, and free market uh, capitalism naturally produces lower and lower prices. And, um, you know, I posted that out on or tweeted that out today. And a lot of people said, yeah, but, you know, wages go down. Well, yeah, but if, if your wages are going, which would you rather have? Would you rather have your income go down by 1% per year and prices of the stuff you buy go down by 2% per year? Or would you rather have your income go up by 1%, but the prices of the stuff you buy go up by 2 or 3%, <laughs> right? Just because your income goes up doesn't, think about how much your income, the people in Venezuela, Think about how much their income went up, but it doesn't mean that they're getting any richer. They're, they're getting a lot poorer. So, but also too, if you look at the 1800s, wages actually went up in nominal terms and income per capita went up. Nominal GDP went up, um, but yet, <clears throat> excuse me, but yet prices of the stuff you buy every day went down. Uh, from 1800 to the year 1900, that 100 year period, prices went down by 50%, five zero. So I don't, I, I don't want to put words in Snyder's mouth because obviously he's a hell of a lot smarter than I am. But um, he's saying that there was an economic slowdown during the 1870s, excuse me. Now, th the extent of the slowdown is very unclear. He said a lot of the people in the labor unions claim that it was massive. When you actually looked at the data, it wasn't that big of a deal. But at the same time, we had industry really growing. If you look at an article I saw on Mises.org, uh, 
which uh, let me just get this straight. Yeah, Mises.org. Uh, they talk about, and also too, I guess Mises has like a wiki thing, which is really cool. I've been looking at that today on the um, Panic of 1873, and they show that first and foremost, it was most likely created by the expansion of the money supply during the Civil War. So it goes back to, to war and the Fed being kind of the root of all evil, if you will. And, um, and then some you know expansion of the banking system. The banks were nationalized, or we had this national banking system that took over during the Civil War, and we had free banking prior to that. So we had a massive expansion in credit. It was the typical boom bust cycle that you have that um, you know Mises outlined or the Austrians, their, their business cycle theory. You had this play out. So uh, through th this call it five year period, it's it's not that we had this massive depression like we think of in the 18, excuse me, 1930s. Uh, we had slower, economic growth. So we didn't have uh, the economy declining. And then we saw uh, prices go down significantly. So a lot of the mainstream economists, without digging into the data, just assumed that this was a horrible, horrible time because who would want prices to go down? But when you actually look at it, it's, it was a, a time of pretty significant economic growth and the standard of living for the average Joe increased. But I think Snyder's point is that the trend decreased slightly and they we, we, we didn't grow at the capacity which that we had. So why is that, right? So that takes us to today and what we're dealing with. From, and I mean today, I mean from pretty much 2000, uh, getting worse in 2008, GFC, and then I would argue getting progressively worse since then. Uh, yes, we've had the stock market go up, but I would argue that uh, within, with with the exception of a, a you know maybe a year time back in two thousand nine, <clears throat> the economy for the average Joe and Jane has uh, gotten significantly worse, and the standard of living has decreased as well, on aggregate total I think, and uh, so again we ask the question why. So let's go to um, you know Mises studied this extensively. Let me go ahead and do a screen share. And normally I do a loom video for this. Oh, did it work? Ah, oh, shoot. Oh, I'm working on my laptop today, so it's not letting me do it. Well, ah, shoot. I guess I'll just go ahead and describe it to you. <laughs> uh, uh, Mises, and then maybe I'll put links in the descriptions. And I, I, I would normally use loom, but again, I'm on my laptop and it's not working, so that's why I went live. Anyway. Mises said, it's just your typical boom bust cycle through the expansion of credit. Because just because the money supply increases doesn't mean that the supply of goods and services increase as well. So at some point in time, although you see nominal economic growth, that has to come back down to the level of which the, the, the real economy is producing goods and services. So the, we had this boom in the after the Civil War, let's say, when the banks were nationalized. I was reading some statistics. Actually, I probably go to the stats now. Um, but the statistics, like at the beginning of the Civil War, when we had uh, free banking, which means that there was no government involvement whatsoever with the banking system, and obviously no central bank. Um, there were roughly 370 some odd state banks, and that number went up to like 1,200 uh, by uh, 1873. Um, and then the national banks went up significantly as well. I think from like 1,000 to 2,000, they almost doubled in the span of, um, you know, call it, uh, what, five, eight years maybe? And so you had this huge growth in, in banking system, the, the financial economy, if you want to call it that, and you had a massive expansion of credit as well. And then we saw the, the you know, this, one of the things, one of the catalysts for the 1873 panic was this railroad going completely bust. And, you know, they just overbuilt the railroad. So Mises would argue that, okay, you've got this massive expansion in, the, in credit and the money supply, this creates malinvestment. 
and some at some point in time that's going to go bust and then it's going to come back to the levels or maybe down a bit you get that um, completely out of the system and then you start over and it, you get the, the cycle again what the way you get rid of the cycle is you get rid of fractional reserve banking that was his argument uh, go to a full reserve banking now let's keep in mind the fractional reserve banking was a was a creation of the free market it wasn't necessarily government i think we, we we conflate the two but so first and foremost what you'd want to do is you would want to restrict the money growth or at least create a system where we had free banking where the expansion of the money supply even though we're on a gold standard remember that the money supply can grow even though we're on a gold standard with fractional reserve banking but notice we didn't have these huge boom busts uh, or to the extent that we have them in uh, in 1873 or especially after 1913 prior to uh, the, the civil war so we are on this free banking system where the private banks themselves the owners of the bank they had skin in the game if the bank goes bust they're they're out of business right there were no bailouts in fact, a lot of those banks issued their own currency or their own IOUs against the deposit of gold that people held with them, right? So that makes, so what that does is that that forces the bank to lend prudently. It forces the bank to lend not for consumption, but for production. Right. So then if the money supply is growing, but the but the the amount of goods and services that are being produced is growing at the same rate, then that's good. <laughs> that's a good increase in the money supply. That's fine because we're, we're, we're becoming richer. Right. Um, so the, the, the fractional reserve banking in and of itself, I don't think is really the problem. It's when you get the government involved or the central banks, right? So my point is step number one, you go back to a system like free banking or maybe even full reserve banking where it's it's the, the government isn't part of the equation. There are no bailouts, which forces the banks themselves to lend in a productive manner. And Richard Werner, who's, who's fantastic, he talks about this all the time. I'm sure many of you are big fans of Richard Werner. He talks about the local lending in Germany compared to these big national conglomerates and how the national conglomerates are only interested in, in creating derivatives, as an example, where a local community bank, they're connected to the, the, the entrepreneurs, the people who they lend to and they, they create productivity. They create a higher standard of living. They don't just financialize the economy. And this is what we saw prior to the Civil War. OK, so step number two. And uh, I want to give all the credit to Emil and Jeff. I would highly suggest watching, uh, if you're on YouTube, their most recent um, video. I know they turned it into a podcast. Let me slip, switch over to it here. It's making their channel is uh, Alhambra Investments, but their their show is called Making Sense Euro Dollar University. And this is episode forty four point or part one. And this is on YouTube. If you go to the uh, iTunes, I think the part one and two are just one uh, long podcast. So however you like to consume the content, um, up to you. But uh, part one is up on YouTube right now where you can get this, this whole information uh, or download that I'm referring to that I've been really enjoying this morning that I'm using for tomorrow's uh, whiteboard video. So anyway, um, what they did is, is Jeff and Emil looked back on an individual. I don't recall his name, but he was the person that, that was first started to analyze the unemployment rate. And this was done in Massachusetts in the early 1870s as a result of them trying to figure out, okay, why is there an economic slowdown? Well, let's make sense of this. And, and let's try to figure out, is, is, is this a bunch of hype or do we really have an, a, a problem with unemployment? Why are people unemployed? What's happening to wages? So, so they really started to, to dig into the data. And then in the early 1880s, this gentleman was hired, I, I believe, by the, um, the presidential administration at the time 
to try to figure out why they've had some some slower economic growth or why they're not growing the economy isn't growing at its full potential and the conclusion that uh, he came to which um, kind of lines up with uh, Keynes's theory of animal spirits is that a lot of an economic slowdown or a, a decrease in an economic output relative to capacity has to do with this it's a it's it's a it's a mental state that the society gets into and it goes back to uncertainty that if you had to, if you have to remember one word from this entire video it's uncertainty so when you combine this the austrian business cycle theory this boom bust with the credit expansion that we now have with national banking and of course today with central banking it's it's in an extreme when you combine that with uncertainty it's almost impossible for the economy to grow um, at, at maximum capacity and i would argue it, it's probably impossible for the economy to grow at all when we're talking about the actual private sector. And to me, this makes a lot of sense because I've been an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur for, shoot, almost uh, you know, 12, 15 years. I've started many businesses. I've had some that did well, some that didn't do too well, but I've been there, done that. I've, I've hired thousands of employees in my day. The last business I had, as most of you know, had over 100 employees, about $24 million in annual revenues. So, so I, I understand what it's like to take your life savings and invest it into an idea. And I can tell you that um, if there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, let's use California as an example. I mean, how many entrepreneurs right now would take $10 million if that was their, their entire net worth and put it all on investing in some sort of widget manufacturer in California. I, I mean, well, let's look at Elon Musk. I mean, you can like him or hate him, whatever, but he, you know, he's moving, I doubt his entire operation, but he's trying to get out of California for those specific reasons, because there's uncertainty, right? Would you rather start a business in Texas right now or in California? And if the answer is Texas, you have to ask yourself why? And it's simple because there's more uncertainty in California. There's more certainty in Texas. And if you're going to put your, your entire savings into starting a business, you want the, the maximum amount of certainty possible. Let's look at two other extremes. Um, let's look at uh, Switzerland and Venezuela. Right? What's the difference there? Certainty and uncertainty. There's no way you would uh, start a business, most likely in Venezuela, because of the uncertainty, right? So my point is when we look at the stimmies, when we look at the government deficit being $5 trillion, when we look at what's going on with social unrest, and I'm not blaming these people, I think it's, it's, it's a, a symptom of the uncertainty and the symptom of the underlying economy. But it, you look at these lockdowns for heaven's sakes. I mean, <laughs> I'm not gonna sit here and debate the, the health benefits or consequences, whatever. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion and I respect your opinion on that. But the fact of the matter is that creates a massive amount of uncertainty for entrepreneurs and business owners moving forward. Right. So the, the reason why I wanted to go over the economy is broken. I think we all get that. But I wanted to go over. Here's how we fix it. The way we fix it is we try to do our best as a collective group somehow to get in. And, and, you know, I know this is an uphill battle, but we you know, end the Fed hashtag end the Fed. Right. If we could somehow get back to a system of free banking. And if we, we, we could get back the, the uh, certainty, or we would reduce a lot of the uncertainty for sure. We reduced the, the boom bust cycle. We're always gonna have it, but we would reduce the severity of the boom bust cycle. And then if we could just 
reduce the size of government. Remember, before the Federal Reserve, the private sector accounted for 93% of economic output. <laughs> 93%. Now, the numbers, the last time, I, I mean, I did some back of the napkin math. I'm sure you guys have seen on my whiteboard videos. The private sector is maybe 43%, maybe 45% of economic output. When you look at GDP um, from, uh, yeah, so I wouldn't say economic output, but, but more so GDP. So when you look at 2020, you know, so call it 40%. So the government spending is 60% of GDP, or the private sector is only 40%. That That is not good. And if, if you think going back to this, this certainty, right? I mean, if you've got the private sector producing at 93% or 90% of GDP, that's that's going to... That's going to make a lot of entrepreneurs a lot more willing to go out there and start a business, create goods and service services and, and increase the animal spirits. And when you combine that with a banking system that is aligned, see, aligned with the average Joe, aligned with the entrepreneur and aligned with the real economy, I think that's how we really turn things around. And Again, I, I realize it's it's a lot easier uh, said than done, but I think if we pinpoint uh, the problem and and try to think through a solution, that's and then just take baby steps to get there, that's the only way that we solve this problem. So uh, hopefully that makes some sense, and I'm gonna do some shout outs here and. Uh, get on to my research <laughs> so I can figure out more. Uh, the next video I do today, I'll probably do more news driven, uh, just what's going on. I just, I thought this topic would be interesting for the majority of the subscribers uh, on this channel. So thank you for hitting that notification bell for the live stream uh, so early in the morning. I appreciate you guys joining me here. Uh, so let's see, I'm trying to keep my voice down because <laughs> I'm in this rented office. Okay, so we've got uh, Dominique Stape or Stop A is with us. Quantitative disease, yeah, well, maybe that's creating uncertainty. Seeker, Joe Anthony, Magda W, It's Me Pei Tong, okay. Adam Abdel Fata, I'm sure I'm pronounced, mispronounced that. Uh, sorry, Adam. Uh, Adamson Flint, Michael Concord. Oh, it skipped on me. Sorry, guys. Oh, there it goes. Mitchell, Donald Winters, Adam Ahmed, Jeremy Stevens, All Nighter Heater is here. Julius Newman, Yaron Lay. Okay, I think I got most of them, guys. Appreciate your time, and I will see you on the next video. And make sure you check out Emil and Jeff's show making sense either on youtube or the podcast on itunes you guys are going to absolutely love their show and you're really really going to love this most recent episode they did so definitely check it out